I am sorry I, I had to, to take care of these dogs. I am babysitting dogs this day, and uh, sometimes they just bark after shadow. I, there are four small dogs, so you can figure that out. Okay, <laughs> we're going to continue in the trial of the Pope of Rome, um, the Antichrist or man of sin described in the Bible. And it was... Uh, Printed, I guess, published by Tappan and Dennett in 1844. So we got to remember how old this is, okay? Because it is, it is pretty, pretty old. And what I began to read, and you'll see here, it's talking about William Tyndale, and it said that he finished the Old Testament. But our records today in 2022 says that he only did the New Testament, not the Old Testament. That um, I think it was Coverdale. Something, someone like that had finished it, so I'm, I'm kind of confused on that part. Anyway, here we go. <clears throat> part nine. William Tyndale sworn. This witness said that he was born in Wales, that he wished to translate the Bible into English tongue, but was prevented in England, that he went over into Germany and there translated first the New and afterwards the Old Testament, which, being sent over into Great Britain, produced much good that in consequence of his publishing the word of God, the prisoner and his hireling bishops thirsted for his blood, that during the reign of Henry VIII, one Henry Phillips was seized to... I'm oh, sorry, guys, I should have... I should have muted that. That he was in prison, tried and condemned, and that in the year 1536, he was chained to a stake at Philford and burnt, as was supposed, to death. Thomas Bennett, schoolmaster of Exeter, sworn, question, did not the prisoner attempt to kill you in the reign of Henry VIII? Question, I mean, answer, he did. I wrote some papers which I placed on the doors of the cathedral and other churches saying that the Pope is Antichrist and we ought to worship God only and no saint. This gave great offense to the priest under the prisoner's government and they, by his authority, proceeded to curse the author with bell, book, and candle. The priest who was to pronounce the curse being in the pulpit clothed in a white... Okay, hold on. Let's them bark. Okay. The priest who was to pronounce the curse being in the pulpit clothed in white and the friars and monks standing about him, a cross was held up with candles fixed on it when he pronounced his following words. By the authority of God, the Father Almighty, and the Blessed Virgin Mary of St. Peter and Paul, and of the Holy Saints, we excommunicate, we utterly curse and ban, commit and deliver to the devil of hell, him or her, whomsoever he or she be, that have, in spite of God and of St. Peter, whose church this is, in spite of all holy saints, and in spite of our most holy father, the Pope, God's vicar here on earth, and in spite of the reverend father in God, John, our diocesan, and the worshipful canons, masters, priests, and clerks, which serve God daily in this cathedral church, fixed up with wax, such cursed the heretical bills full of blasphemy upon the door of this and other holy churches within this city. Wow, that is crazy. Excommunicate be he, she, or they, plenarily and delivered over to the devil as perpetual malefactors and schismatics. A curse they be, and given body and soul to the devil. Cursed be they, he or she, in cities and towns and fields and ways, in houses and out of houses and all other places, standing, lying, or rising, walking, running, waking, sleeping, eating, drinking, and whatsoever thing they do beside. We separate them, him or her, from the threshold and from all the good prayers of the church, from the participation of the Holy Mass, from all sacraments, chapels, and altars, from holy bread and holy water, from all the merits of God's priests and religious men, and from all their cloisters, or clusters maybe, from all their pardons, privileges, grants, and immunities, which all the Holy Fathers, Popes of Rome, have granted to them. And we give them over utterly to the power of the devil and let us quench their souls they, if they be dead this night in the pains of hellfire as this candle is now quenched and put out. And with that, he put out one of the candles. And let us pray to God 
if they be alive, that their eyes may be put out as this candlelight is. Here he put out another candle. Let us pray to God and our Lady and to St. Peter and St. Paul and all holy saints that all the senses of their bodies may fail and they may have no feeling as now the light of this candle is gone, putting out the third candle. Except they, he or she, come openly now and confess their blasphemy and by repentance as in them shall lie, make satisfaction unto God and our Lady, St. Peter and the worshipful company of this cathedral church. Question, how did you act after you heard this anamatha pronounced? Answer, I wrote other papers till I was apprehended. When I confessed myself to be the author and that I would do the same to discover Antichrist or the Pope who wasted the Church of God. After refusing to recant, I was condemned to be burned, delivered over to the Sheriff of Devonshire for execution, and in Liver Liverydale, without Exeter, I was chained to the stake. Several martyrs who suffered in England during the reign of Queen Mary I were now introduced into the court to give their evidence against the prisoner. Only a few were examined. John Rogers sworn. Question, were you the first person in England who suffered by fire during the reign of Queen Mary? Answer, I was. Mary was employed by the prisoner at the bar as his common executioner in England, and she made a greater proficiency in kindling fires to burn her Protestant subjects than any other hangman before her time. Question, in what year did she begin her reign? Answer, in the year 1553, on the death of Edward VII, Lady Jane Grey had been proclaimed agreeably to the request of Edward, but Mary, who by intrigue and flattery first drew the county of Norfolk to support her claim, soon obtained the crown. She then cut off the head of Lady Jane and her husband, Lord Guilford Dudley. Having established herself on the throne, she proceeded like a female fury to reestablish popery. Cardinal Pole was restored and introduced to both houses of parliament as the Pope's legate and addressed them upon the occasion. The Parliament, after this, drew up a petition acknowledging their sorrow for having rejected the prisoner's authority. Mm, I'm sorry about those dogs, you guys. I could lock them in the cage, but then I would feel kind of wrong. <laughs> okay. Requesting to be pardoned for their offenses and restored into the bosom of the Church of Rome. This petition being delivered to the Cardinal, he gave them absolution in these words. We by the apostolic authority given unto us by the most holy Lord, Pope Julius III, Christ, vice regent on earth, do absolve and deliver you and every of you with the whole realm and dominions thereof from all heresy and schism and from all judgments, censures and pains for that curse incurred. And also we do restore you again to the unity of our mother, the Holy Church. The report of this coming to Rome caused great joy. The prisoner published a bull for a jubilee and went in procession to manifest the pleasure he felt on this occasion. He then delegated Mary to be his agent in England to put to death such as rejected popery, and I and many others were dragged to prison. Question, was you not once one of his priests? Answer, I was. I was educated at Cambridge but being chosen chaplain to the factory of Antwerp, I became acquainted with Tyndale and Coverdale who were translating the Bible. Through their instrumentality by the word, I assisted them to translate. I was led to see the vile conduct of the prisoner and to reject his authority. After this, I married and traveled into Saxony and preached the gospel of Jesus Christ for some years. Upon the ascension of King Edward VI, I came into England and was appointed to a prebend of St. Paul's, where I was stationed on the return of Popery. On a complaint being made that I preached the doctrines of the Reformation, I was cited before the prisoner's bishops and condemned as a heretic. During my confinement, I drew up an answer to the charges brought against me and vindicated the doctrines of the atonement and justification by the imputed righteousness of Christ. After undergoing the ceremony of degradation, I was conducted to the flames in Smithfield. My wife, with her ten children, 
and myself requested an interview with each other before I was changed the stake. But so little of the milk of human kindness did my enemies possess that our united request was not granted. I was chained to the stake and flames were kindled around me, which continued to burn till I was delivered out of their sight. This was in the year 1555. Lawrence Saunders, William Piggott, Stephen Knight, Thomas Tompkins, Thomas Hawks, John Lawrence, and William Hunter, being sworn, said they were all chained to separate stakes, to separate stakes, and burnt by order of the prisoner. Lawrence affirmed that when he was brought to Colchester to be executed, his legs being so worn by heavy irons in prison and his body so weak, he was obliged to be carried in a chair to the stake and the fire kindled around him sitting. Robert Farbar, Bishop of St. David's, and Rollins White, a fisherman, both of Wales, were next examined. They proved that they suffered in like manner by the prisoner's orders. A pile of iron chains was now produced to the court, which had been used by the prisoner to bind the witnesses and others to stakes. Roland Taylor, vicar of Hadley in excess, being examined, affirmed that he was cited before the Bishop of Winchester, whose name was Stephen Gardner, and who, next to Bonner, was one of the prisoner's most active and cruel executioners, that he was sent up to London to the Queen's Bench Prison, and after repeated examinations was condemned to be burnt as a heretic, that he was sent down to his parish to be executed, that as he entered Hadley, the streets were lined with his old parishioners who in general manifested their sorrow on his account, that at Aldam Common, the place of execution, he addressed the spectator saying, I have taught you nothing but God's holy word and am come hither to seal with my blood those doctrines of the gospel I have delivered unto you. That being chained to the stake and the fire kindled, he was burnt till he was delivered out of the fire and left nothing but a few ashes, which led the prisoner and others to suppose he was dead. Bishop Latimer sworn, question, did not the prisoner attempt to burn you? Answer, he did. Upon the ascension of Mary, I, with Bishop Ridley and Archbishop Cranmer, was sent to the tower and from thence to Oxford to dispute with 12 men under the prisoner's government selected, selected from Cambridge and Oxford, the prisoner's order, burnt together in one fire at Stratford near London on the 27th day of June, that the Dean of St. Paul's, having declared in a sermon he preached after their condemnation, that they held as many different opinions as persons. They drew up and signed a declaration of their faith, part of which they declared that the See of Rome was the See of Antichrist, the congregation of the wicked, whereof the Pope is head under the devil. Upwards of 200 other witnesses were in court who were martyred in the reign of Queen Mary. But the Attorney General said that, as it was not necessary to examine them to prove the guilt of the prisoner, he would only bring forward one witness to prove the number that were burnt during her short, cruel reign. I think, did I? Hold on, I think, I think I, I think I, I did. I am so sorry, you guys, I did. I think I, when I, I did. I skipped a page. Let me go back. Let's retract that. Here we go again. Bishop Latimer sworn. My fingers are not working right today. Question. Did not the prisoner attempt to burn you? Answer. He did. Upon the ascension of Mary, I, with Bishop Ridley and Archbishop Kramer, was sent to the tower and from thence to Oxford to dispute with 12 other men the prisoner's government selected from Cambridge and Oxford. When the disputation was ended, we were brought as prisoners on a stage and asked whether we would persist in our opinions or recant. We all affirmed that we would persist and were then condemned as heretics to be burnt, but our execution was suspended for some time. Question, was Nicholas Ridley, the bishop, chained to the same stake with you? 
answer, he was. We were both chained together at one stake in Oxford. I was then about four score years of age, and my infirmities was much increased by the severity of my confinement. Yet, as my day was, so strength was given. Having long since declined my ecclesiastical dignity, I appeared at the stake without any clerical habit. Ridley and I embraced and encouraged each other at the stake. He said to me, God will either ass ass assuage the fury of the flames or enable us to endure it. And so he did. The faggots being kindled, I was soon taken in a fiery chariot to my king. But Ridley was delayed for some time longer when he was mercifully delivered in like manner. Bishop Ridley, being examined, confirmed the testimony of the last witness. Cranmer, Archbishop of Canterbury, sworn, question, did not the prisoner condemn you? Answer, he did. But I suffered for a long time in confinement before he attempted to execute the sentence. I was also so weak that one day my threats and promises, vice threats and promises, I was persuaded to sign my recantation, though not the one published by Cruel Bonner. This, however, availed me nothing. The tender mercies of the prisoners are cruel. I was required to ratify my recantation publicly and then to die for heresy. Being called upon to address the people in St. Mary's Church, Oxford, my enemies were thunderstruck at hearing me express my sorrow for my apostasy and weakness and declare the Pope to be Antichrist. And that I would first burn my unworthy right hand that signed the recantation. Immediately a violent clamor ensued and I was hurried to the place of execution. A fire being kindled round me, I held my right hand in the flames till it was burnt, repeating this unworthy hand, this unworthy hand, and calling upon the Redeemer in the words of Stephen, Lord Jesus, received my spirit. When I was rescued out of their hands, this was on the 14th day of February, 1556, at Oxford. And we'll let them bark for a minute. Okay, I guess they're done. George Marsh affirmed that by order of the prisoner, he was burnt at Westchester. Robert Smith, that he was burnt at Uxbridge. Thomas Whittle, that he and six more were burnt in one fire at Smithfield on the 27th day of January in 1556. Anne Albright said that she and three other women and one man were burned at two stakes and one fire at Canterbury the 31st day of January. Joan Trunchfield and Agnes Porter, is that Porter? Yeah, both married women that they were burned at Ipswich, Robert J Drake, that he and five more suffered at one fire in Smithfield. And on the 23rd day of April in the same year, Catherine Hutt, that she and two other women were treated in like manner at the said place. Thomas Drury, a blind boy, that he and one Thomas Croker were burnt at Glashire. Ralph Jackson, that he, 10 men and two women, in all 13 were the prisoners orders burnt together in one fire at Stratford near London on the 27th day of June, that the Dean of St. Paul's, having declared in a sermon he preached after their condemnation, that they held as many different opinions as persons. They drew up and signed a declaration of their faith, part of which declared that the Sea of Rome was the Sea of Antichrist. The congregation of the wicked, mm -mm -mm, where of the Pope is head under the devil. Upwards of 200 other witnesses were in court who were murdered in the reign of Queen Mary. But the Attorney General said that as it was not necessary to examine them to prove the guilt of the prisoner, he would only bring forward one witness to prove the number that were burnt during her short, cruel reign. Mr. Historical Truth again examined question. Shh, hush now. Do you recollect how many were burnt during the reign of Queen Mary? Answer, I do. She burnt one archbishop, four bishops, 21 ministers, eight gentlemen, 84 artificers, 100 husbandmen servants, 
and laborers, 26 wives, 20 widows, nine unmarried women, two boys, and two infants. One of them was... <clears throat> One of them was whipped to death by Bishop Bonner and the other springing out of the mother's womb from the stake as she was thrown again into the fire. Several died in prison and many were otherwise cruelly treated. <sighs> Question, were these burned by the prisoner's orders? Answer, yes. He not only presumes to put to death those whom he calls heretics, but his bishops take an oath that heretics, schismatics, and rebels to the Holy Father or the prisoner they will resist and persecute. One of his annotations on the New Testament says, Protestants foolishly expound it. Example, Babylon, notice in Revelation, chapter 17, verse 6 of Rome, for that they, for that there they put heretics to death and allow of their punishment in other countries. But their blood is not called the blood of saints, no more than the blood of thieves, man killers, and other malefactors, for the shedding of which, by order of justice, no commonwealth shall answer. I don't have words. I'm sorry. Sir John Temple swore in question. Did you write the history of the rebellion in Ireland, 1641? Answer, I did. It was printed in Dublin. Question, do you believe that the prisoner was the ringleader of that rebellion? Answer, he certainly was. His own bulls show that he was so deeply concerned in that dreadful insurrection. When he was known by the name of Urban VIII, he publicly by a bull promised to reward the Catholics of Ireland with a plenary indulgence and remission of all their sins. I can repeat a part of that bull in his own words. They are as follows, quote, Urbanus Octavius and company. Having taken into our serious consideration the great zeal of the Irish towards the propagating the Catholic faith and having got certain notice how in limitation, how in imitation of their godly and worthy ancestors, they endeavor by force of arms to deliver their enthralled nation from the oppression of the heretics and gallantly do in them that lieth to exasperate and totally root out those workers of iniquity who in the kingdom of Ireland had infested the mass of Catholic purity with the pestiferous leaven of their heretical contagion. We, therefore, being willing with the gifts of those spiritual graces whereof we are ordained, the only disposers on earth, and by virtue of that power of binding and loosing of souls, which God was pleased to confer upon us to all and every one of the faithful Christians in the aforesaid kingdom of Ireland. Now and for the time milating against heretics, do grant a full and plenary indulgence and absolute remission of all their sins, desiring heartily all the faithful in Christ now in arms to be partakers of this most precious treasure. Dated at Rome in the Vatican of St. Peter's Palace, May 25th, 1643, in the 20th year of Pontificate, A.M. Mardellus. He also wrote to the rebel O'Neill, October 18th, 1642, and to the Popish clergy and nobles of Ireland to the same effect. Question, were many murdered in the year 1641? Answer, yes, many thousands in a cruel manner. Mr. Hume, the historian, sworn in. Question, do you recollect how many are supposed to have been killed in the Irish massacre? Answer, by some computations, though who, those who perished by those cruelties are made to amount to 150 or 200,000. By the most moderate and perhaps the most probable accounts, they must have been near 40,000. The clerk of the crown then read extracts from several examinations taken by virtue of commissions under the great seal of Ireland recorded in the archives of Dublin and in possession of the clerk of the council. Dr. Maxwell, the deponent, 
said that the rebels confessed to him that they killed one morning in the country of in the county of Antrium, 954 persons and 1,100 or 1,200 more in the said county. Owen, Franklin, and others said that above 1,000 were drowned in one river in the county of Armagh. Many others murdered, 50 at Blackwater Church. William Blundell was drawn by the neck up and down Blackwater, and three weeks afterwards, he and his wife and seven children were drowned. A wife was compelled to hang her husband. 22 protestants were put into a thatched house at Kilmore and burned. 1,500 murdered in three parishes, 300 stripped naked and put into the church at Longall and above 100 murdered. John Gregg was quartered alive and his quarters thrown in the face of his father, who was afterwards quartered in the presence of his wife. 500 were murdered at Ardmog, besides 48 families near it. 18 Scotch infants were hanged on Cathair's tinter hooks in the county Tyrone, and 140 women killed by two rebels, 45 by one woman, 316 at Dunganum, 300 in their way to Calarine, and 400 drowned in the said county. At Sligo, the Protestants being all taken to jail at midnight, they were stripped naked and two butchers hired to kill them all with axes. The white friars who employed the butchers afterwards pretended with holy water to purify the river with the stain of heretics blood. In most counties, nearly all the English that could be taken were murdered. At Kilney, seven were hanged and one Irishman because he was taken in their company. At the prisoner, let's see, let me, okay. At the same and other places, men and women were stripped naked, but some covering themselves with straw, it was set on fire by the rebels. 22 widows and others in the King's County covered themselves with straw, which was fired. Many who escaped died naked and some with children in their arms by the frost and snow. Women who were pregnant were killed in a manner too indecent and shocking to relate. Lou Maxfield was dragged out of his bed, raving in a burning fever and murdered. His wife also, who in labor was stripped naked, and drowned in the river Blackwater, the child half born. The attorney general, after the examination of a very considerable number of respectful witnesses, observed that many more might be called who would not only prove the prisoner to be the promoter of the rebellion of 1641, but also of those of 1798 and 1803, but he considered it altogether unnecessary. Some of the shocking barbarities were accompanied with circumstances too cruel and indecent to be noticed here. They are, however, printed in several books. The last witness was now called to prove that the prisoner did presume to appoint places of refuge for murderers, thieves, etc. <clears throat> King Edward, the confessor sworn, question, do you know whose handwriting this is? A paper produced to this witness. Answer, I do. I wrote it by order of the prisoner. It was read by the clerk of the crown. Quote, Edward, by the grace of God, King of Englishmen, I make it to be known by all generations of the world after me that by special commandment of our Holy Father, Pope Leo, I have renewed and honored the Holy Church of the Blessed Apostle St. Peter of Westminster, and I order and establish forever the, uh, what person of what condition or estate soever he be from whence ever he comes or for what offense or cause it be flying for his refuge into the said holy place. He, is, he be assured of his life, liberty, and limbs. And over this I forbid under pain of everlasting damnation that no minister of mine or my successors intermeddle them with any goods, lands, or possessions of the said persons taking said sanctuary. For I have taken their goods and live load into my special protection. And therefore I grant to every and each of them inasmuch as my terrestrial power may suffice all manner of joyous liberty. 
and whoever presumes or doth contrary to this my grant, I will that he lose his name, worship, dignity, and power, and that with the great traitor Judas that betrayed our Savior, he be in the everlasting fire of hell. And I will and ordain that this my grant, grant endure as long as there remaineth in England either love or dread of Christian name. These people were sick. Question. Did many thieves, murders, and other scandalous characters occupy this building? Answer. They did. Till they were so very numerous that I was obliged to build a new church on the north side for their use, which was dedicated to St. Margaret. And down here in Asterix is Vid Maidlin's Historical London, volume 2, page 1328. The evidence here closed on the part of the prosecution. Counselor Quibble, my lords and gentlemen of the jury, I, as the assigned counsel for the prisoner at the bar, feel it my duty to make such a defense as the nature of the charge and evidence will admit. I am not under the necessity of making a long statement in the defense of the prisoner, and therefore shall not trouble you, the court and jury. Gentlemen of the jury, you will studiously endeavor to banish from our your minds every ext extraneous matter you may have heard that does not come within the charge preferred against my client, and only consider the evidence that have been given on the part of the prosecution. With respect to any question of law in this case, I yield to the learned lords on the bench and to matters of fact, they are solely for the determination of you, gentlemen of the jury, who are the sole judges of the testimony you have heard from the witnesses. The charge against the prisoner at the bar is high treason, com compassing the death of the king and promoting rebellion in all the earth. He also stands charged with divers murders in several countries to wit in Paris on the 24th of August, 1572, and in England, Ireland, Scotland, and other places. The evidence which we have to produce is evidence of an alibi visual that the prisoner was not at Paris on the 24th of August, 1572, nor in England, nor Ireland, nor Scotland, when those murders were committed. Should the evidence that will be produced raise in your minds, gentlemen of the jury, any doubt of the prisoner's guilt, you will, of course, acquit him. For, there, for where there is a doubt on the mind of a jury, it is better that the 500 guilty persons should escape punishment than that one innocent man should suffer. You will also consider, gentlemen, that your verdict of guilty may place him in a pr premature grave. There are circumstances I am here compelled to notice that some of the evidence against the prisoner are the evidences of common informers who were Luther, Calvin, and others that are called reformers. Were they not once priests? Were they not once connected with the prisoner? They violated their oath when they deserted his church and the testimony of such should be doubted. Gentlemen of the jury, the unfortunate gentleman at the bar has seen much better days. His situation really calls for pity and not vengeance. He has been a great sufferer of late. His influence is much reduced. He has been made a complete tool of, and his power is crushed almost to nothing. I am addressing you, gentlemen, as sensible and dispassionate men, and therefore I look up with confidence to you to give a verdict in favor of my unfortunate client. We shall now call some witnesses as to the character of the prisoner and the evidence he has by means of his friends been able to produce in his favor will be weighed by your humanity. Witnesses on behalf of the prisoner. Mr. Hate controversy was first examined. He said that he had some knowledge of the prisoner, that he thought him an honest man, that he never deferred with him or liked people to fall out about religion. On cross-examination, he confessed he knew him only by name. Thunanus said that he wrote several books, that he took notice of the Waldenses and of the Parisians massacre, that to his knowledge, the prisoner was at Rome at the time, as he was also in the reign at the time as he was also in the reign of Queen Mary and at other times when he was charged with committing murders in England, Ireland, and other places. 
Several other witnesses said the same. On cross-examination, however, they admitted that his government extended to these places and that it was by his laws they were put to death. Mr. P. Painter said that he had known the prisoner more than 1,200 years, that he had painted many pictures for him, and that he always paid him, honestly. C. Carpenter, B. Bricklater, P. Plaster, S. Slater, P. Plummer, C. Carver gave the prisoner a good character. Demetrius Silversmith said that he had made more shrines by order of the prisoner than ever were made by Diana of the Ephesians, and that he always thought the prisoner a very useful man. J. Jeweler and B. Beadmaker said the same. R. Robemaker said that he had received many thousands orders from the prisoner, whom he always respected much, that he had made various sorts of robes for his archbishops and all the orders of his clergy, that he took yearly some hundred thousands of pounds for gowns, surplices, scarves, sashes, cassocks, bands, etc., and that in some countries the bare washing of surpluses only among one order of clergy amounted to more than 13,000 pounds a year. In Bonaparte said that he knew the prisoner, that he came a long journey to crown him emperor, and therefore he was compelled to speak well of him. Mr. Half Protestant said that he never knew any harm of the prisoner, that he always thought more was said of him than was true, and that he respected the names of several witnesses examined, such as Luther and others, but did not see the reason why they disagreed. He admitted that he had heard of murders committed by him, but thought he was much altered for the better and was quite a different man. He thought that everyone should keep to the religion he was brought up to, and if sincere, it was all that God would require. Require. Mr. Solicitor General, my lords and gentlemen of the jury, you need not be under any apprehensions of my intruding too much on your time. If this was only an ordinary case, I should make no observations, but it is not only a question as to the guilt or innocence of the prisoner at the bar, but of many thousands who have been more or less concerned in his treasonable designs and also others who have combined con connived at his awful rebellion. Gentlemen of the jury, with respect to the evidence which has been laid before you on the part of the Crown, I shall, I shall be very brief. I have little more than to call your attention to and follow the statement of my able friend who first stated the case. Evidence has been laid before you to prove that a conspiracy has existed for several hundred years to overthrow the government of heaven and compass the death of our sovereign Lord, the King. Gentlemen, the question is whether the prisoner was a par participator of that guilt. You will determine by the evidences whether he was not the very life and soul of that awful conspiracy. You have heard it proved that the prisoner lived at Rome as the universal bishop, head of the church, and God on earth, that he committed numberless murders. The instances that have been laid before you must have made the chain of restraint, but not until you are dead. But while you are yet alive, did I mess that up again? I did. I am so sorry, you guys. I tell you, my fingers are not working. Let me get to it. Okay. The instances that have been laid before you, you must have made too great an impression on your minds to require me to repeat them, and they are few to the number that could have been produced. Gentlemen of the jury, you will draw your inferences from the testimony of the witnesses and not from any statement of mine. There is one witness, Mr. Historical Truth, who, from his knowledge of the prisoner's conduct for several centuries, has been enabled to give much evidence his testimony is confirmed by a considerable number of emperors, kings, and queens. Martyrs, reformers, and others have confirmed their united testimony, and inspired apostles have satisfactorily proved that all his power was usurped. Gentlemen of the jury, it has been stated by the prisoner's counsel that the prisoner was not at several places where he is charged with committing murder that he was not at Paris on the 24th of August, 1572. 
and other places. This, the council must know, is a mere quibble. He was in Paris, he was in England, and he was in Ireland, and wherever his government extended, wherever his agents executed his laws. He has existed under a variety of names which mark his guilt. His arrogance and ambition have no example. It is a question of if even Lucifer himself could vie with him. The prisoner has endeavored to storm the skies, to dethrone the almighty thunderer to be universal Lord and claim the stars of heaven. Gentlemen, I shall not trespass further upon your feelings, believing that your verdict will be according to truth. Lord Chief Justice Revelation addressed the jury when every minutia of evidence was summed up with legal precision and ability. It would, no doubt, be gratifying to some readers to have his charge at length, but the limits of the trial will not admit it. He concluded by observing that he left the determination of this case entirely to the consideration of the jury, and that if they entertained a rational doubt in their minds of the guilt of the prisoner, they ought to acquit him. The jury did not retire from their box, but brought in their verdict guilty. The clerk of the Crown called upon the prisoner at the bar in the usual form to know what he had to say, why judgment of death should not be awarded against him. When the prisoner gave him a most expressive, solemn look and remained silent, the Lord, the Lord Chief Justice addressed the prisoner in the most impressive manner. He told him, that he had been charged with the awful crime of high treason against the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That he had a most patient trial and there was no doubt either in the mind of the court or jury that he was guilty. He also said that he was sure his conscience must frequently have told him that his rebellious conduct must not fail to bring down the vengeance of heaven upon his guilty head. He concluded thus, I call upon you now to attend to the sentence of the court. You, Antichrist, shall be taken from the place where you now stand to the place from whence you came. Your irons are to be struck off and you stripped of all your pontifical vestments, splendor, pomp, and dignity. From thence you shall be drawn upon a hurdle to the place of execution where you shall be hung with the chains of restraint, but not until you are dead. But while you are yet alive, your church, which is your body, shall be taken down, and you deprived of the vitals of your religion. Then a mighty angel shall proclaim from heaven louder than the most tremendous peal of thunder, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and that the hour of your judgment is come. Your head or dominion shall then be struck off with the sword of God's inflexible justice, when the Lord of hosts himself will consume it with the spirit of his mouth and destroy it with the brightness of his coming. Then another mighty angel shall take up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon, or Rome in parentheses, be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. And you shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord, utterly burned. I mean, strong is the Lord who justifieth. I'm sorry, I got distracted by this stupid electronic thing over there. And you shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth you. And may the Lord have mercy upon the souls of all those who live and die under your government. Some Protestant writers having by mistake noticed the time when the sentence would be put into execution, it may not be amiss to observe that it was left entirely to his majesty's sovereign will and pleasure. Appendix. From the Reverend Dr. Brownlee's Roman Catholic religion viewed in the light of the prophecy and history, I shall here present to my reader a brief sketch of the present operations of the Roman Catholics in our Republic. They are actually carrying into effect the commands of their foreign master at Rome. He is, by their avowed creed, superior to all magistrates in the land, and his commands bind them, even in temporal things, in defiance of all human laws. The purpose of Rome expressed to the priests is to regain Britain 
and these United States to his spiritual and thence to his temporal dominion. For in no land and at no time does the Pope separate state from the church. Under his dominion, the state is always made a tool of by the church. In lands not thoroughly reformed from popery, the union of church and state exists, but with this difference that the state makes a tool of the church. To attain their grand object, the two D propaganda, the one at Rome and the other in the south of France, together with the Leopoldine Institution at Vienna under Prince Metternich's patronage are now most actively employed. Their labors are, are, are alarmingly efficient in raising large funds and in training young priests and Jesuit agents and hurrying them in the fields of operation. The Society of Jesuits, whose atrocities, principles, and crimes had caused their expulsion from each of the nations of Europe and at last their final dissolution by Pope Clement the 14th in 1773 was organized anew by Pope Pius VII in 1814. The cause of Rome and despotism had then become so desperate that none but these desperados and reckless outlaws were deemed capable of bringing aid to his sinking church. And a new generation having sprung up which knew not the history of these papal lifeguards, these conspirators against God and man. They are again tolerated in Europe and America. They are men who would rather reign in hell than serve in heaven. With them, all things are right when sanctified by the end. Really. To lie, to advise theft, to rob, to assassinate by the seal and the chalice, are with them with virtuous deeds when they promote the interests of Rome. The proof of this is on the pages of Molina, Lesius, Vagquiz, Escobar, and the rest quoted by Pascal in his providential letters. And I can't say that, that's in Latin, I think. But down here it says, these spirits who sell themselves to do evil with them that is the holiest which brings the highest price. Such was the picture of them from the pen of the good bishop, Jeremy Taylor. And we refer for their practical result to the ecclesiastical and political history of Europe for the best comment on their inexpressible enormities. These bandits and licensed conspirators are now in full, uncontrolled spiritual operation among us. They are spread over the land. They are found in every disguise. They force their way into our schools and colleges, as it appears in the painful case of old Oxford. They are found as agents, peddlers, editors, orators, preachers, dispensed. In the West, they come out without a mask and threaten to take the land by storm. A protean tribe one knows not what to call which shifts to every form, nor true to all. Grammarian, painter, auger, rhetorician, rope dancer, fiddler, conjurer, physician. Gifford's Journal. Wow. Gold and silver, literature and cunning, and to sum all up in one word, Jesuitism itself are all put in requisition. Guys, you, you get, do you understand this was written in 1844? We have been blinded for how many years? How is this even possible? Wow. The simultaneous movements over our land are guided by heads cool and deliberate and plotting ruin by hearts that never yielded to the soft yearnings of charity or mercy, and by hands that never shrunk from deadliest and bloodliest crimes. And all are consummated by legions from the de propaganda, as sleepless and as untiring and vigilant as the senators at the gates of pandemonium. The following is an outline of their operations in this republic. One, they erect splendid edifices 
by money derived from foreign societies, and they invite our youth to witness and unite with them in the varied fascinations of pompous dress, their imposing music, and the solemn shows of their idolatrous ceremonies. Two, they conceal their exclusive and repulsive sentiments. They adapt themselves to popular belief and put forth the most plausible expositions of their motley system, making the vulture to ape the gentleness of the dove, dove and the lion the loveliness of the lamb. Three, they have for years been making incredible exertions to monopolize the education of our youth, of both sexes, of the influential Protestant families of the land, while they studiously neglect tens of thousands of their own children who are growing up utterly without education. The object these proselytizing emissaries from Rome have in view is manifest to the most superficial observer. Four, as a religious sect, they move by foreign impulse and a body in all political measures. They keep themselves entirely distinct from Protestants and offer themselves to the strongest party or to any party who will secure them the most favors and power to enable them as a religious sect to undermine our religion and liberty. Five, their leaders and prelates affect the most extraordinary liberality and the most patronizing condescension toward their dissecting brethren. The Protestants and they appeal to their well-known liberality and charity for aid to build their chapels and they most shrewdly flatter the high-mindedness and generous spirit of half Protestants who never refuse to aid the weak and the innocent and persecuted Catholics, while nothing so soon throws them into a rage as to ask them to reciprocate. Wow. Number six, they are annually sending in upon us colonies of priests and laymen who swarm over the whole land and seize upon every opportunity to extend the influence of their bigoted system upon the ruins of morals, religion, and liberty in America. Number seven, they combine their influence as a religious sect to bribe and overawe the press. Men are subsidized and regularly pensioned who are the editors and contributors of many of the most popular presses in London. And this is the case on the prominent point in our republic. Number eight, they alarm and encourage the fears of timorous and lukewarm protestants. No, I have not, but I have heard of um, Samuel Morris. I know they, I think he was the inventor of the Morris Code, and he was also a friend of Abraham Lincoln, but I will look that book up. Okay, number eight, they alarm and encourage the fears. In 1830, wow. Amazing. Okay, number eight, they alarm and encourage the fears of Timorous and lukewarm Protestants by impressing on, upon them with much solemnity and with many awful insinuations that there is great danger to public property, to church buildings, and to personal safety of those who venture to oppose them by speaking or writing against Jesuitism. What a picture, by the way, this gives of the untamable, warlike spirit of this religion. Number nine, they flatter and caress timorous half-Protestants and public men and spare no pains to persuade them to use all their efforts to discontinuance and to frown down those who do conscientiously expose their dangerous tenets and fatal operations. They sigh over Protestant bigotry and they are all anxiety just to be let alone to pursue quietly. Hi, Ellie. Okay. Um, they sigh over Protestant bigotry and they are all anxiety just to be let alone to pursue quietly in their own way their secret conspiracy against our holy religion and our Republican institutions. Number 10, in their haste and unabated struggle to obtain the funds of our public schools, they have two main objects in view. One, if possible, to throw every barrier in the way of universal popular education and so to perpetuate ignorance 
the mother of their devotion. Two, to obtain for their own sect, if practicable, the public funds to endow their, numer their nunneries and secretarian colleges to train up priests and perpetuate the race of nuns and thence promote more effectually the interests of their foreign master at Rome. Number 11, the Roman priests oppose our common schools. The reason is clear. It is there the youth learn the genuine principles of Republican liberty and are taught to love their country and stand by her institutions against all foreign influence and aggression. The Roman prelates and priests as a body are aliens. These from abroad cannot be genuine citizens or even citizens at all. The oath imposed by Rome on each bishop binds him in soul and heart, in tongue and hand, to the only master and ruler whom he can own, namely his sovereign lord, the Pope. Hence, his sovereign lord, well, okay. Hence, the Roman Catholic religion creates in our republic an imperium in imperio, a strong, combined, and united foreign power in strict allegiance to a foreign civil and religious government. Hence, popery will not allow its youth to mingle with protestant youth if by any means, even including force, it can prevent it. And even its adult members, it concentrates around it as a distinct political religious party to wait the offers of the strongest political party be what they may be, who make them the best and most lucrative offers. They have no patriotic politics in any of the states. They care exclusively for their own sect. They go around like a celebrated man at Jerusalem in the days of our Lord. And with a cap in hand, they say to the dominant party, be it for the administration or be it against it. What will you give us? And we will betray the other party into your power. Number 12. And lastly, a society of wealthy individuals in Dublin and in London has lastly been announced to go into operation for three objects. One, to send into the Western states of America the surplus population of Britain, Ireland, and the continent. That means the worst of men. Men steeped in moral leprosy whom they cannot endure there. These are good Catholics and will at the confessional act productive to be priests. Two, to open a new market for British manufacturers. Three, to extend and consolidate the Roman Catholic religion in the United States. They propose to buy up Western state stocks at the present reduced prices, obtain public lands for them, then send out immense colonies of Catholics well officered by bishops and priests, and thus they will gradually gain the ascendancy in the West. And on a map which they have emitted and which has been published here, they have marked the grand points for the location of these ghostly colonies in Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, and Upper Canada. The map is now lying before me. And down here um, in asterisk, it has, see a copy of it published in the Home Missionary of the American Home Mission Society for November 1842 with an outline of the whole plan of that new British society. Wow. This present scheme is unquestionably one of their most feasible projects. And at the same time, it is to our Republic, the most alarming movement that has been contrived. It is got up by the Jesuits who will conquer or die. If we be not thoroughly awakened by this, it must be because the offended God of our fathers is about to bring on us a national and tremendous visitation such as we have never yet felt as a people. Wow. Think about it. Look who we have in the office right now. He's an Irish Catholic Jesuit president. And then as vice president, she attended a pres uh, Jesuit college. That's all crazy. All right. Roman priests deny that in Rome, the Pope is called God. They reputate the expression, Noster Dominus Dies Papa, 
the Lord our God, the Pope, but I shall here give a strong confirmation of the contrary, which fell under my eyes recently. On March 21st, 1843, I was examining the original documents of the Reverend L. Gassatinini, who came, yeah, for real, and who renounced Romanism in Geneva and is now a Lutheran minister in Pennsylvania. These documents were written and sealed at Rome. I discovered the following expressions, which are uniformly used at Rome in all such documents given to students and licentinates as priests. And I can't say those words that's in Latin, unfortunately. I can't pronounce any of that. Translated thus, given at Rome at our house this first day of February in the year 1827, induction the 14th of the pontificate of our most sacred and most holy father and our Lord and God, Pope Leo XII, by the providence of God and his year. What? The fourth. So right there, they're calling him God, holy father and Lord. And people want to say he's not antichrist? That is insane. Right there it is. I mean, right there, that's all you got to do is print it out. Given at Rome at our own house this first day of February in the year of 1827, induction, the 14th, of the pontificate of our most sacred and most holy father and our Lord and God, Pope Leo XII, by the providence of God and his year, the 4th. What? Then follow the signatures of the vicar and secretary as above. Now, we challenge any priest or bishop in the land who professes to have genuine testimonials from Rome to produce them before witnesses to show that they want these words. No, I can't say these words. It's like Patris at Dominio Nostri D. I don't know what that means. In most of the copies, the sentence is contracted thus. Patris at D N D and company, but every one of the priests as well as ourselves know what these expressive initials stand for. And if any priest or bishop from Rome has testimonials without the words of our most sacred and most holy father and our Lord God the Pope by the providences of God and company, then are they defective, mutilated, and false papers. Oh, I see. So D, I got it, okay. D &D. Hmm. from the numbers of Brutus first published in New York Observer but some of my readers notwithstanding they may be convinced that it is for the interest of despotism to subvert our institutions and are even persuaded that this grand enterprise has been actually undertaken may be inclined to ask in what manner can the despots of Europe effect by means of popish emissaries anything in this country to counteract the influence of our liberal institutions. In what way can they operate here? To any such inquirers, let me say, there are many ways in which a body organized as are the Catholics and moving in concert might disturb, to use the mildest term, the good order of the Republic and thus compel us to present to observing Europe the, spec the spectacle of Republican anarchy, who is not aware that a great portion of that stuff which composes a mob ripe for riot or excess of any kind, and of which we have every week or two a fresh example in some part of the country, is a Catholic population. And what makes it turbulent? Ignorance, and ignorance which it is for the interests of its leaders not to enlighten. For enlightened a man and he will think for himself and have some self-respect. He will understand the laws and know his interest in obeying them. Keep him in ignorance, and he is the slave of the man who will flatter his passions and appetites or awe him by superstitious fears. Against the outbreakings of such men, society as it is constituted on our free system can protect itself only in one of two ways. It must either bring these men under the influence and control of sound Republican 
and religious education, or it must call in the aid of the priests who govern them and who may permit and direct or restrain their turbulence in accordance with what they may judge at any particular time to be the interest of the church. Yes, be it well remarked, the same hands that can, whenever it suits their interest, restrain, can also at the proper time let slip the dogs of war. In this mode of restraint by a police of priests, by substituting the ecclesiastical for the civil power, the priest-led mobs of Portugal and Spain and South America are instructive examples. And start not, American reader, this kind of police is already established in our country. And that was in, what, 18, 1844. Mm -mm. We have had mobs again and again, which neither the civil nor military power has availed anything to quill until the magic peace be still of the Catholic priest has hushed the winds and calmed the waves, a popular tumult. That is insane. In Charleston, South Carolina, the Roman Catholic bishop, England, is said to have boasted of the number of votes that he could control at an election. I have been informed on authority, which cannot be doubted, that in New York, a priest in a late election for city officers stopped his congregation after mass on Sunday and urged the electors not to vote for a particular candidate on the ground of his being anti-Catholic. The result was the election of the Catholic candidate. Our institutions have already withstood many assaults from within and from without, but the war has now assumed a new shape. An effort is now making that it, it, that it is to try the moral strength of the Republic. It is not a physical contest on the land or on the water. The issue depends not on the strength of our armies or navies. How then shall we defend ourselves from this new, this subtle attack? The first thing to be done to secure safety is to open our eyes at once to the reality and the extent of the danger. We must not walk on blindly, crying all's well. The enemy is in all our borders. He has spread himself through all the land. The ramifications of this foreign plot are everywhere visible to all who will open their eyes. Surprising and unwelcome as is such an announcement, we must hear it and regard it. We must make an immediate, a vigorous, a united, a preserving or persevering effort to spread religious and intellectual cultivation throughout every part of our country. Not a village nor a log hut of the land should be overlooked. Where popery has put darkness, we must put light. Where popery has planted its crosses, its colleges, its churches, its chapels, its nunneries, Protestant patriotism must put side by side college for college, seminary for seminary, church for church, and the money must not be kept back. Does Austria send her tens of thousands to subjugate us to the principles of darkness? We must send our hundreds of thousands, ah, our millions, if necessary, to redeem our children from the devil bondage of spiritual and temporal slavery and preserve to them American light and liberty. The food of popery is ignorance. Ignorance is the mother of papal devotion. Ignorance is the legitimate prey of popery. But someone here asks, are not the Roman Catholics establishing schools and colleges and seminaries of various kinds in the destitute parts of the land? Are not they also zealous for education? May we not safely assist them in their endeavor to enlighten the ignorant? Enlighten the ignorant? Does Popery enlighten the ignorant of Spain, of Portugal, of Italy, of Ireland, of South America, or of Canada? What part of instruction is that in the latter country, for example, which leaves 78,000 out of 87,000 of its grown-up scholars, signers of a petition by their mark, unable to write their own name, and many of the remaining signers who write nothing but their names? What sort of light is that which generates darkness? Popery enlightened the ignorant. Popery is the natural enemy of general education. Do ask for proof. It is overwhelming. 
Look at the intellectual condition of all the countries where popery is dominant. If popery is in favor of general education, why are the great mass of the people in the papal countries I have named the most ill-informed, mentally degraded beings of all the civilized world, arbitrarily shut out by law from all knowledge by that which makes them slaves to the tyranny of their oppressors? No, look well to it. If popery in this country is professing friendship to general knowledge, it is a fiend alliance. It, if it pretends to be in favor of educating the poor, it is a false pretense. It is only temper, tempering, temporizing. It is conforming for the present from policy to the spirit of protestantism around it, that it may forge its change and less suspicion with less suspicion. If it is establishing schools, it is to make them prisoners of the youthful intellect of the country. If the Papists in Europe are really desirous of enlightening ignorant Americans by establishing schools, let us make their first efforts among their brethren of the same faith in Canada and Mexico. Do our fellow citizens at the South and West ask for schools? Are and are there not funds and teachers enough in our own land of wealth and education to train up our own offspring in the free principles of our own institutions? Or are we indeed so beggared as to be dependent upon the charities of the Holy Alliance and the Jesuits of Europe for funds and teachers to educate our youth? In what? The principles of despotism? Forbid it patriotism, forbid it religion. Our own means are sufficient we have wealth enough and teachers in abundance. We have only to will it with the resolution and the zeal that have so often been shown. Whenever great national or moral interests are to be subserved and every fortress, every corpse of Austrian darkness would be surrounded, the lighted torches of truth, political and religious, would flash their unwelcome beams into every secret chamber of the enemies of our liberty and drive these ill-omened birds of a foreign nest to their native hiding places. Our liberties must be preserved, and we say, and say firmly to the popish bishops and priests among us, give us our declaration of your relation to our civil government. Renounce your foreign allegiance, your allegiance to a sovereign, to a foreign sovereign. Let us have your own avowal in, in an official manifesto that the democratic government under which you here live delights you best. Put your ecclesiastical doings upon as open and popular a footing as other sects. Open your books to the people that they may scrutinize your financial matters, that the people, your own people, may know how much they pay to priests and how the priests expend their money, that the poorest who is taxed from his hard-earned wages for church dues and the richest who give his gold to support your extravagant ceremonial may equally know that their contributions are not misapplied. Come out and declare your opinion on the liberty of the press, on liberty of the conscience, and liberty of opinion. Americans demand it. They are waking up. They have their eyes upon you. Think not the American eagle is asleep. Americans are not Austrians to be hoodwinked by popish tricks. This is a call upon you. You will be obliged soon to regard, nor will they be content with partial, obscure avowals of Republican sentiment in your journals. Be insulated priests or even bishops. Burning of the Bibles. The fact of the public burning of Bibles by the Catholics at Chamberlain, New York, a town on the borders of Lower Canada and not far from Lake Chamberlain, Cham Champlain, is now established beyond a doubt. The Journal of Commerce publishes an official statement of the facts in the case furnished by a committee appointed for that purpose by a public meeting of protestant inhabitants of the place. The committee are the pastors of the Congregational and Methodist churches, a clergyman who is principal of an academy and the postmaster. In the year 1839, a single society in France sent nearly $70,000 to aid the various papal prelates in the United States. The items which go to make up the sum stated are here given. They are taken from the main number in 1840, 
of the annuals of the propagation of the faith printed in Lyons, paid to the Lazarus for the missions to Missouri and Illinois, the seminary and college of St. Mary de Barens, seven, what? 7,000 francs. Outfit of missions who left in 1839 to join their missions, 9,333 francs. To the Jesuits for missions in Missouri and New Orleans, 15,000 francs. Ditto in Kentucky, 6,000 francs. They there were also sent to my Lord Ecclestone, Archbishop of Baltimore, 7,327 francs. To my Lord Lauren, Loras, Bishop of Debecu, 52,627 francs. To my Lord Purcell, Bishop of Cincinnati, 39,827 francs. To my Lord Fenwick, Bishop of Boston, 20,327 francs. To my Lord Kenrick, Bishop of Philadelphia, 20,327 francs. To my Lord Hughes, Acting Bishop of New York, 831 francs. To my Lord Miles, Bishop of Nashville, 26,807 francs. To my Lord Flaggett, Bishop of Bardstown, 21,409 francs. To my Lord Haladineri, Bishop of Venicini's, 65,827 francs. To my Lord Rususi, Bishop of St. Louis, 20,327 francs. To my Lord Blanc, Acting Bishop of Nantes, 10,827 francs. To my Lord England, Bishop of Charleston, 13,827 francs. Outfit of missionaries to Detroit, 4,000 francs. Total, 341,862 francs and 80 cents. I guess it'd be cents. The same society is said by the Catholic Almanac for 1839 in a note on the life of Bishop Dogbird to have sent $160,000 to the United States in a single year. Let it be not supposed for a moment that these remittances are either occasional or recent origin. They are known to be at least annual and must amount to immense sums distributed all over our nation to seduce and corrupt it. And I'm going to end that there. I mean, I do got just a few more pages to go, but I got to see if the dogs have got to go outside. So I'm going to end that there, brothers and sisters. Keep your eyes on Jesus, your nose in the book, which is the word of God. And embed the word of God upon the tablets of your hearts. So you and I will not sin against God or be deceived. Until next time. Bye-bye. All right. And I think that's it on that.